Welcome to the Gross Point Historical Society's second Dr. Frank Bicknell lecture of the 2021 season. As a result of the ongoing pandemic, we're once again virtual uh, with an online program. We really appreciate your attendance. And I see we're at 30 uh, uh, people signed on, but last month I, we had about 40 and we found that we had about 50 people because there were multiples at different locations. The Gross Point Historical Society lecture series is named in honor of Dr. Frank Bicknell. His daughter and son-in-law created the Society's Dr. Frank Bicknell Trust Fund to mark Dr. Bicknell's 80th birthday in 1987. Dr. Bicknell attended all these programs till his passing at the age of 92 in 1999. I'm Mike Skinner, chairperson of the Society's Bicknell Committee. The other members of the committee are fellow members of the Society's Board of Trustees, Adam Hellebuck and Susan Lewandowski. Adam is this evening's moderator, handling the technical issues relating to an online program. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Sue. Uh, we look forward to returning to, to in-person programs when we reach the new normal, hopefully sometime in 2021. But as of right now, it appears that all of the 2020-2021 lecture series through next May will remain virtual online programs. Meanwhile, we hope that you will consider donating to the Gross Point Historical Society's capital campaign as the society raises funds to build its new administration and collection resources building, which will be built across Kirchwall from the Society's circa 1823 Verbonsal Warehouse Museum, the oldest remaining home in the Gross Points. The fall lecture series is composed of programs that have been rescheduled from March, April, and May after the coronavirus pandemic made it impossible to hold in-person programs. Now let me describe the November and spring programs before introducing this evening's speaker. The November 18th program will feature the Arcadia Publishing History Press book, Wicked Women of Detroit. This program will describe some of Detroit's most violent, clever, and misunderstood stood females. The author is Tobin Buck, uh, and he describes himself as a connoisseur of crime, a gourmet of the ghastly, an aficionado of the atrocious, and a fanatic of the felonious, and a maven of misdeeds. Should be interesting. He's been featured as an expert on the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum. We're also excited to announce for the first time the 2021 Spring Lecture Series. Uh, as you know, the lectures, as you may recall, uh, the lectures are held in September, October, November, and then again in March, April, and May. Uh, so we start back up in March, and the Wednesday, March 17th program uh, is entitled Detroit Civil War Sites and Stories, and is based on a section of the Arcadia Publishing History Press book, Michigan Civil War Landmarks. You see the cover there on the left. And I would like to note, and you'll be receiving this information, uh, but at the bottom, there'll be a separate registration for each of these programs uh, that will be coming to uh, all of the Gross Point Historical Society members uh, and supporters uh, at a later date. When America faced its greatest internal crisis, the Civil War, the Detroit area called, answered the call with thousands of volunteers. During this program, we'll learn more about the abolitionists, politicians, soldiers, regiments, events, monuments and statues, and graves in and around the city which relate to the Civil War. The evening's presenter is David Engel, who co-sponsored this book. Then the April 21st, 2021 program uh, will be entitled Gross Points, Real Estate Point System, and Ethnic Diversity in the Community during the 1960s. The authors of the 1972 book, Gross Point, Race Against Race, and the new September 20th, or, I'm sorry, 2020 book, the, uh, the Fort, Growing Up in Gross Point during the Civil War Movement, will be the presenters. And you see uh, the cover of those two books there. This program will mark the 55th anniversary of the first African-American family purchasing a home in the Gross Points, which was done by a straw buyer because of the point system. Uh, the the African-American family could not uh, buy a house in the Gross Points directly. And the 50th anniversary of the elimination of the community's appalling gross, uh, real estate point system. This system was utilized to keep certain ethnic groups from moving into the Gross Points. This program will also deal with the Detroit uh, Gross Point tensions in the 60s and Dr. Martin Luther King's speech at Gross Point High and now Gross Point South in 1968. Uh, lastly, but certainly not least, May uh, 19th of 2021 will feature um, the new Arcadia publishing book, Grand Estates of Gross Point. Being held during Preservation Month, uh, the May programs are always, uh, have been over 20 years now, co-sponsored by Gross Point's greatest example of historic preservation, the Hetzel and Eleanor Ford House. This book is filled with photographs that illustrate the fact that during the 
early 20th century Gross Point transition from a summer retreat for wealthy Detroit families to a year-round home for prominent professionals who hired the finest architects money could buy to design and build grand mansions. And so it's, it's a wonderful book if you haven't seen it. I hope you can join us for that. Finally, tonight's program features the Arcadia Publishing History Press book, Early Organized Crime in Detroit, Vice, Corruption, and the Rise of the Mafia. This ex book explores Detroit and, metro, and the metro area struggle with gang violence, public corrupt, corruption, and politics of vice during the first half of the 20th century, and touches on the Gross Point Park residents who were thought to be part of the Italian mafia and who continued their family business from the points in the uh, beginning of the second half of the 20th century. Tonight's uh, presenter is the author of this book, Dr. James Bucciolato, who has been a, a, a faculty member in the Department of Criminology and Crime Justice at Northern Arizona University and at the Ur Urban D. Reed Honors College at Wayne State University. Dr. Bucciolato uh, researches and writes about the politics of crime, and his work has appeared in peer-reviewed journals, crime anthologies, and on national uh, news uh, websites. He also is a certified gang specialist and a National Gang Research Center, uh, I'm sorry, with the National Gang Research Center in Chicago. He uh, co-hosts the podcast, Original Gangsters, and has also appeared as an expert on organized crime and gangs in documentary episodes featured on Vice Television and the Travel Channel. A native Detroiter, he's been fascinated by his family's history in uh, Sicily, Italy, and Detroit since he was a child. Uh, and by the way, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. Uh, I'll be reading the questions off and the doctor and uh, Mr. Bucciolato will be um, handling those. So I'd like to introduce James Bucciolato and turn it over to him. Thank you. Peter, should I sh uh, share the PowerPoint now or do you want me to talk? Yep, or... yep, we're, yep okay. we're, we're good to go. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's share this so everyone can see and I'll start it from the beginning. And then we'll see, hopefully people have questions at the end. Um, so as was pointed out, Early Organized Crime in Detroit, uh, that's the name of the book. And uh, I'll, I'll start off um, telling you a little bit about myself and then um, why I wrote this book. And then the organization of the presentation will match the subtitles, Vice Corruption and the Rise of the Mafia. So as was pointed out, um, I'm a, I, uh, my background is in criminology and political science, so um, I write about uh, historical case studies related to the American Mafia, but also the American Outlaw. Uh, I've published some things about uh, Billy the Kid, Pretty Boy Floyd. I've also published some things about the contemporary gang situation in Detroit. Um, and I'm interested in theoretical criminology, uh, but also obviously historical case studies as we're going to talk about today. Um, why this topic? I just thought I'd take a moment to explain why I, I wrote this book. And um, I think there are some great books out there about organized crime history in Detroit. Uh, for example, I could give a shout out here to a couple of people I know. Uh, Daniel Wall wrote a great book called Off Color about the history of the Purple Gang. And Scott Bernstein, a friend of mine, wrote a great book called Motor City Mafia. Um, but um, uh, Daniel Waugh's book is is mostly about the, he does talk about the Italians in there, but his book is mostly about uh, the Jewish gangsters of Detroit, and uh, that's the Purple Gang. And then Scott Bernstein's book is more of a comprehensive history, so he talks about a little bit about the early days, but he also talks about the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And so um, as much as I admire these two books, I, I, I wanted to read something that was just about the origins of Italian gangs and Italian organized crime in Detroit in the early 1900s through the 1930s. And there just wasn't, I couldn't find that book. So I decided um, I'll write that book myself. And um, that's, that's the, the background to my interest in this and, and writing this book. So um, I, I thought about when, when in terms of organizing this presentation, um, rather than get bogged down in all the different names and, and characters, I think it's easier to follow if we just follow the, the, the subtitles. Um, Vice in Detroit, so we'll talk about the rackets, and then we'll talk about corruption, and then the, the rise of, of specifically Italian organized crime in Detroit. 
So um, in my research, I was able to find out that the, the rackets, the vice rackets were really diverse in Detroit during the early 1900s. Really a lot of the same types of vices we uh, are aware of today. And um, you have uh, illegal gambling parlors. You can, you can see a picture there on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, you had brothels for post prostitution, but also drugs. Um, sometimes I think we think that drugs is um, maybe something more contemporary, maybe at least going back to the 60s, but actually um, illicit narcotics, that's been an issue in the United States for a long time. Um, by the way, I think I see a typo there on my PowerPoint, so I hope, I hope no one's grading out there. <laughs> but anyhow, um, illegal uh, gambling parlors, I think it's a typo there. But anyhow, um, so back then it would have been like opium was a more common um, narcotic used um, illicitly back then. And so um, it, I think it's interesting because we're talking about the rise of industrialization in Detroit. And as um, we have economic development in the city, you have more and more people working and more and more people having um, accumulating disposable income. And it's sort of interesting to see how when that happens, some people like to use that disposable income <laughs> to uh, let's say entertain themselves in ways that may not be legal. So you, 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 see, you really see a correlation to a rise in, in the vice rackets with industrialization in Detroit. As we have more and more economic prosperity, we see more and more um, illegal gambling opportunities, brothels, things like that. Um, in, in terms of the gambling rackets, what did that look like? A lot of the same gambling rackets we see today, uh, dice games, you know, shooting craps, illegal lotteries, that was huge back then. Now we can, of course, go to a liquor store, supermarket and, and, and play the, the lotto. But back then, uh, the only way you could play that was through some kind of organized crime racket. Um, card games, sports betting, especially back then, uh, baseball and, and horse racing were very popular. Um, and prominent examples of sports betting. Um, and other types of crimes that uh, people get into just like today, uh, grand larceny, so theft. I mean, the gangsters back in the early 1900s uh, would steal anything they could get their hands on. Um, auto theft, this is another thing that I found in my research, which is I think really interesting is as soon as we start, as soon as we start making cars in the city of Detroit, <laughs> people start stealing them. So I, I just, I, I found that this, this sort of makes sense in a way. So right away, and, and then prior to that, I don't have this in the PowerPoint, but I think this is interesting. Power to, uh, prior to that, actually horse theft was, was, a, was a problem in Detroit. When you think about the fact that um, you know, not everyone had a car at, at that point, at least in the very, very early days. So they would steal anything they could get their hands on, um, loan sharking, so um, that's still an issue with organized crime even today. Extortion, that was a big issue in, in some of the Italian neighborhoods um, on the east side um, where a, a local restaurant or a local uh, grocer had to uh, pay the, the local mafia protection money. Um, but I, I want to point out something before we move on to the next slide. Um, my research, I'm, I'm more interested in Italian organized crime, but I want to make sure people who are interested in this understand that they, they by no means uh, had a monopoly on these types of rackets. I mean, they weren't the only people involved in these uh, rackets. So I don't know if this will make sense, but even though these are organized criminal activities, that doesn't necessarily mean an organized criminal group is involved with that racket at that time. So the Italian mafia were certainly involved in these things, but so were lots of other groups. You had Polish gangs, Irish gangs, um, African-American gangsters, Jewish gangsters, Anglo-Saxon gangsters. And then in some cases, just people that weren't gangsters at all, just people that were, you know, interested in, in, in gambling um, or what have you. So um, I, I just, I think that's uh, important to note for, for historical reasons. But these are some of the examples. Um, but, but I think the, the real heavy duty example here is, is booze. Um, you could not make the kind of money in the underworld just by running card games 
and stealing cars and shaking down restaurants through extortion. You could not make the kind of money with those activities that you could selling illegal booze. That's where you have these guys who are kind of maybe like street thugs running card games and, and, you know, stealing things off the backs of trucks. And, and then they, they be, start to become more sophisticated racketeers and what we think of as organized criminals today because they were able to make so much money from um, the, the sale, manufacture and sale of illegal booze that they accumulated so much money, it became much more of a sophisticated operation. So you'll see here, I have, this is where the gangsters made the real money. And again, it wasn't just the Italians involved in this all. You had, again, Anglo-Saxon, bootleggers, Irish, Jewish, Greek, um, et cetera. So um, I, I'm embarrassed to say that until I started writing this book, I, I had not been aware that Michigan actually implemented, that we went dry before the nation did. Um, I didn't know that. So uh, we actually experimented with prohibition a couple of years before the nation did. So we implemented a statewide ban on alcohol in 1916. Um, and I, I think the lesson here is, if, if I may get on my soapbox for a moment here, is um, I think we can think about this in terms of public policy today and, and that prohibition doesn't work with, with other kinds of um, examples of, of vice, but I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. But it doesn't seem to work. It didn't work then, it doesn't seem to work now. When, when people want things, they find a way to get it. And, and you really have an example here. So you can, Michigan can go dry. So what did gangsters do? Well, they just drove down to Ohio, which is right. I mean, this makes, it makes so much sense. Um, the Dixie Highway down there, you drive down to Toledo and uh, you just drive it back up to the Detroit area. And, and you can look at the astronomical profits that these guys were making. And, and I think you can see here, this illustrates that they just really couldn't make the kind of money and other types of rackets that they could with booze. You could buy a case of booze for $8 in Toledo and then sell that for $75 a case in Detroit. Um, but you can see by looking at those images that this was a precarious um, endeavor to get involved in. You see there's some well-armed guys there in that picture. And um, so you had rival bootleggers competing with you, but you also had, in some cases, law enforcement. Um, that uh, may give you a hard time for selling booze. You'll, you'll see in another PowerPoint slide that for the most part, law enforcement did not give people a hard time, but in some cases they did. So we'll jump ahead here. So then we have the 18th Amendment. Actually, the, uh, the whole nation goes dry not long after that. So you can no longer just drive down to Toledo and smuggle booze back up across um, the Ohio border there. But Detroiters were uniquely positioned because maybe we can't drive to Toledo, but we can drive just as close really, if not closer, and that's across the river and go over to uh, Windsor. So the reason why I say we were uniquely positioned because bootleggers and gangsters in, in other cities, um, right, they didn't live that close to a source like we did. So um, the, the gangsters and bootleggers in Detroit in many ways supplied the rest of the nation with illegal booze because we were able to get it uh, faster. We had more uh, direct access to it. Um, now actually, Windsor was dry too at one point, but there was a, a loophole there where there were other provinces in Canada that were wet. And you could pretty much make up a flimsy excuse to justify getting booze down to Windsor. And then it was smuggled over to Detroit from there. So these are a couple of interesting photos that are in my book. You can see there, um, uh, there uh, in some cases when the uh, river would freeze, people would just drive across, sometimes not very successfully as you can see there, <laughs> but if the, if the water was frozen enough, you could drive across. In other cases, people would uh, smuggle booze on toboggans. Um, so you, you can see like it, it's, it's, as I was mentioning earlier, it's, it's not always gangsters involved in this. In some cases, they were just people that wanted, wanted to drink, or in some cases, maybe wanted to drink and make a little extra money on the side. So you had, you had varying, various degrees of, or varying degrees of scale in terms of these kinds of operations, how much, how much booze you, you would bring over. 
but overall, if you look, if you look at it, I mean, it was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, if you look at the bottom PowerPoint bullet point there, uh, 1920 uh, liquor manufacturers ship over 900,000 cases of booze to Windsor. Well, we know that people in Windsor didn't all of a sudden acquire this, this extraordinary taste for booze. Um, it's pretty obvious why they were, they were shipping that down to Windsor because they knew it was going to end up, end up in Detroit. Um, my research indicates that this Detroit Windsor Nexus was supplying uh, as much as 75% of the nation's beer and liquor during prohibition. So again, this is a big time operation we're talking about here, at least to the extent that organized criminals were involved in it. And you can see a couple of other images here. Um, one is a raid, police raided um, uh, a place where they were uh, storing booze and then you have here a photo that demonstrates how the operation works on the Detroit River where they unload the booze. And so uh, in some cases we were even supplying Chicago, uh, supplying uh, Al Capone and some of his people with booze. Um, let me see here. Um, and this was the way, I mean, if, if the, the best type of booze you could purchase were booze that were smuggled from a place like Canada. In, in other cases, bootleggers were smuggling booze from the Caribbean or from Europe, but if you could get commercial grade alcohol, that was the best type of booze to drink because there were other options. Um, there were distilleries, illegal distilleries in Michigan, in the Detroit area, and that would have been fairly good quality. Um, for the most part, those were run by gangsters. But in other cases, you had real mom and pop operations manufacturing their own booze and they, they called it rot gut for a reason. So uh, that would not have been very pleasant <laughs> type of booze to consume. So if you could get the commercial grade stuff from Windsor, um, you, could, you, could, you could make a lot of money smuggling that. But I think here's another example of the, how prohibition doesn't work. If you look at the PowerPoint slide there, before Prohibition, there were 1,500 saloons and 800 illegal liquor joints in um, the city. And if you're thinking, well, why, how could they be illegal liquor joints if, if booze were, if it was legal? Um, we're just talking about like after hours places. So, so you have 1,500 traditional saloons, 800 uh, after hours joints. But by the end of Prohibition, you had 20,000 of these blind pigs and speakeasies in Detroit. So um, I, I think it actually made the, the pro if you wanted to stop people from drinking, this actually did the exact opposite of that. So you can see a, an image there of some, some people enjoying a, uh, an alcoholic uh, beverage there. And then another example there of where there was actually a police raid where they dumped out the booze um, from, from a place that where they were storing it. But again, I think this gives you an, an idea of the scale of how, how, how much money was to be made in this racket. So this is, this is a nice segue to the, the second subtitle in my book, which is corruption. And another problem with prohibition was it created conditions for large amounts of corruption, public corruption at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. Um, and so one of the indicators here that this is becoming a more, these gangsters are becoming more sophisticated is not only the kind of money they're making, but with that money, they have, um, they can buy politicians, they can bribe police officers. And um, now you're talking about insulation. And you can really become embedded as a criminal organization. You can really become embedded in society um, once you have that kind of political protection, political cover, and insulation from prosecution. And that takes a lot of money. And they were making a lot of money from prohibition, and they and they they used it to to infiltrate and and bribe public officials. So this is just one of the more conspicuous examples of corruption in Detroit. There, there are plenty of other examples, but the, this was, a, I think, 
one of the bigger ones. It was called the, the Graft Trust Scandal. It started in the late 1920s. And uh, one example here, a federal grand jury determined public officials had accepted $500,000 in bribes. So, that, I mean, that's certainly a lot of money, I think, for, for most of us today. But especially back, back then in the late 1920s, that's an extraordinary amount of money. But you can look at some of the people that were being uh, bought off. I mean, these aren't just your local beat cops. I mean, U.S. Customs, uh, immigration officials, prohibition agents, uh, they were all part of this conspiracy to um, either look the other way or actually participate in, in the smuggling of alcohol. And I'll note a couple of other things about this slide. Um, this is the, the first picture now we're going to see of an actual member of the mafia. And this is uh, Peter Licavoli. And um, he was the leader of the River Gang, which was a, a faction in the early mafia. And they, they controlled the, so the, the Italian crime group, their interest in smuggling booze across the river, uh, Peter Licavoli and his gang controlled that. And they made a lot of they made a lot of money, and he seemed to be the the grand conspirator here, the the guy who was organizing this um, effort to corrupt federal and local officials. Um, it worked a couple of different ways, depending on the arrangement. Um, in some cases, the gangsters would would pay the the corrupt police by the case. So if if the local law enforcement or the federal law enforcement allowed you to smuggle so many cases over, you just paid, paid by the case. But in other cases, law enforcement would charge by the hour. So they would say, okay, between two and four o'clock, we could guarantee there will be no Coast Guard and you could just come and go as, as you please smuggling booze after four o'clock we have to clamp down again and um, you may get in trouble. And the reason why is, right, we, we, we still need to keep the, the pretense up that this is real. Prohibition is real, that we're trying to do something about stopping um, alcohol, which I, I would argue was, was not true at all, but they wanted to keep that, that facade going. So sometimes they would charge by the hour. And I, I just think it's interesting to point out the different ways that they, they would make those arrangements. Um, some other examples here of actual uh, local uh, corruption. I have, uh, I talk a lot about in my book, uh, Mayor Bowles, and also the, the murder of Gerald Buckley. And um, so we're talking late 1920s, early 1930s. So under the Bowles administration, I, I have an image of him in a moment. Uh, Detroit was considered an open city. So he, he had a he was on friendly terms with a lot of the organized crime groups in the city, um, Irish, Italian, Jewish, didn't matter. And so um, the word went out to local law enforcement to basically leave these operations alone, leave the brothels alone, leave the gambling parlors alone, the speakeasies, the blind pigs, leave them alone. And uh, Gerald Buckley was a popular radio host at the time. One of the first examples of a, of a sort of nationally known media personality. I mean, when I, when I lecture to my students about this in my crime and media class, it's, it's difficult to explain how uniquely important Gerald Buckley was. I mean, this is way before cable television, there was no television, way before the internet. Even radio was in its infancy. I mean, Gerald Buckley was one of the first big media personalities, um, you know, in terms of beyond print media. So he was nationally known, and he was, but he was broadcasting out of Detroit, and he was very popular, and he had this kind of populist appeal, and so he would criticize the big shots, criticize the elites, and part of his argument was that they were corrupt, including the mayor and, and members of law enforcement. So this really generates a lot of momentum and, and you know, people are genuinely upset about this arrangement that the mayor has. And so a recall vote is um, results. And actually Mayor Bowles was recalled uh, July 22nd, 1930. And later that evening, Gerald Buckley was assassinated at the LaSalle Hotel downtown, which is, which is no longer there. 
I think I have an image here of the old LaSalle Hotel. That's Gerald Buckley, the radio personality in the middle. And that's um, Mayor Bowles there at the bottom. Um, again, when I lecture about this with my crime and media class, I try to make sure the students understand how extraordinary the situation was. For organized criminals to assassinate a public uh, a personality, media personality, and in, in, um, you know, right, right in front of everyone, um, in the lobby of a hotel, well-populated hotel, it's really extraordinary. I mean, I, I think like if try to imagine like I mean, I hate to use specific names here for such an awful scenario, but if you think of like Anderson Cooper or Mitch Album or somebody like that, just a well-known media personality. And if an organized crime group just took them out in, in public, I mean, I, I, it's unimaginable to me. It, fortunately, it's, it's unimaginable today. But that's what happened here in Detroit in 1930. So pretty extraordinary uh, situation here. Another example of corruption that I talk about in my book uh, relates to um, some of the shady connections that Ford Motor Company had with the underworld. And really the, the nexus of that relationship is, is Harry Bennett. I mean, that's, that's really the, the person we need to focus on here. And I think he's a really fascinating character. And I, I think I would argue one of the, the most interesting people that I wrote about in the book. And I refer to this chapter as the gangster industrial complex. And he was Henry Ford's right-hand man. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, he was this sort of like man without a uh, portfolio at Ford Motor Company. He was, he was in some ways the, the second most powerful person at Ford Motor Company, but sometimes he didn't even have an official title. Um, so it's, it's just a really unusual arrangement that they had. But he was, the, in a lot of ways, the muscle for Henry Ford. So he would work with the mob as strike breakers. And I think uh, when we talk about labor and organized crime, a lot of people think about Jimmy Hoffa and, and what happened in starting in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Um, but prior to that, the, the relationship was, was on the other side. Actually, organized criminals were working with management, not, not like the infiltration of, of, of labor. So in this case, Henry Harry Bennett would hire a mobsters as strike breakers uh, to, to beat up um, people who were um, protesting or going on strike workers. Uh, he would grant these uh, lucrative hauling and concessions contracts to, to mobsters. So like um, hauling steel and um, garbage and things like that from the, from the Ford plant. I mean, you can make a lot of money in these contracts. They, these are all mobbed up contracts. Uh, concessions. So, um, you know, so, so supplying um, uh, fruit and vegetables and lunches and things like that in the, in the plants. Those are usually mobbed up contracts and also dealership franchises. And again, I think this is really important to point out because not only are these lucrative opportunities for gangsters, but more importantly, I would say, this is again about insulation. Now, again, just like when you're bribing police officers and politicians, you're starting to rub elbows with and interact with members of the so-called upper world. So not just the gangsters and people in the, in the, in the underworld, but the upper world. And um, you, you, can't, you can't put a price on developing those kinds of connections because, again, this can perhaps help protect you later on from prosecution. Um, so this was really important for, for organized crime to establish this relationship with, with Harry Bennett. You could see a picture of him with, with the old man Ford there. Um, I mean, there's other things in my book you can, you, I talked about with the, the Ford, um, uh, the, the Rouge plant there. I mean, gambling was going on everywhere there. And uh, Harry Bennett allowed that. And, and specifically the mafia guys that he was friendly with were, were making most of the profits from that. And so speaking of that, um, the third part of my third subtitle in my book is The Rise of the Mafia. And again, I mentioned earlier that um, 
I was specifically interested in this case study of, of Italian organized crime in Detroit. So I, I do mention some of the Jewish gangsters in Detroit. I do mention some of the Irish gangsters in Detroit, but for the most part, my case study focuses on, on Italian gangs and Italian organized crime in Detroit. And when you're looking at this case study, it's, it's really important to look at the towns and villages where the Italian mafiosi were coming from. And this is very important because this is like an early form of social networking. Obviously it's not digital back then, but when you're involved in these kinds of rackets and things that you're not supposed to be doing, if you want to work with other people, right, there's, there's only so many ways you can look into the person's past and say, well, is this the kind of person I can trust to keep their mouth shut, to, to do what needs to be do, to, to do what needs to be done, to be a tough guy. And one of the early forms of social networking back then was basically your last name and where you were from. And if you were a mafiosi from say, um, uh, Castellamare and you met someone else in Detroit and you knew the last name, you maybe didn't know them personally, but you knew their uncle or something. And um, you think, okay, this is um, this is uh, Paisano, right? This is somebody I can I can I can trust. So when we specifically talk about the Detroit Mafia, most of the early members were coming from these towns and villages in Sicily, uh, Palermo, uh, Cinesi, Terracini, and Castellamare del Golfo. And you can see some of the prominent families that were involved in the early mafia here in Detroit. Um, of all the different cities, Terracini and, and Chinese seem to be the, the two most powerful factions. Again, there were, there were members from uh, Castellamare, Palermo, uh, Partinico, if you, I don't know if how many, how, if you're familiar with Sicily, but uh, Alcamo, places like that. But Terracini and Chinese seem to be the, the two most prominent factions. And you can see some of the names there. And I write about individuals in my book. But I always have a disclosure here whenever I, I give this kind of presentation. Um, a city like Detroit, these are still very common names. So I just want to make sure that people understand, like, I, I'm talking about individuals that were operating a long time ago. These are very common names. So, so please don't assume, please don't assume if you meet someone out there today with one of these last names, they're very common. Please don't assume that they're involved in anything sketchy um, because um, the, overall, the overwhelming majority of, of individuals in these families, of course, were not involved in these things. But, but some of the people that were happened to have these last names and these are some of the more significant ones and, that I document uh, in my book. And you can see these cities were, were towns were very close to each other. Um, this is an image I took of the the train stop when I was in Sicily here, you can see Chinese and Terracina very close to each other. Um, it took a while for a, a one faction to emerge as the type of hegemonic power in the Detroit Mafia. And it was very bloody. There was a lot of conflict you can read about in my book. Uh, in the 1910s and the 1920s, the different factions uh, battling each other, killing each other. It's pretty, pretty violent. And there was what is known as the, the Crosstown Mob War in uh, 1930. And the faction that emerged as victorious was the um, Terracini faction, which was led by Joe Zirilli and his brother-in-law, Black Bill Toco or Vito Toco. And there's a picture of them there. And the picture of, at the bottom is Joe Zirilli as a young man. And they emerged as the hegemonic faction. and. Um, which means that they really, it really brought like peace and stability to the underworld in Detroit. And I, I talk about that. I'm really fascinated by the politics of the underworld. And um, they were certainly tough guys and violent after that, but you didn't see the kind of wide scale gangland warfare in Detroit. Once these guys took over, that was over. Sometimes someone got out of line and, and <laughs> Some bad things would happen to that person, but for the most part, um, they really kept violence uh, to a minimum com compared to uh, 1910s and 1920s. Uh, you can just see some other images here. Um, that top picture there is of the uh, river gang 
uh, Pete Licavoli's guys, bootleggers there in the 1920s and 30s. At the bottom there, you can see um, uh, Scarface Joe Bomarito is there, some of the other people that I write about that were affiliated with that faction. These guys are all from Terracini. And uh, this picture at the top here, uh, Vito Toco or, or Black Bill Toco, a really colorful, charismatic uh, gangster. He really, um, I think, um, was like, um, what's, the, what's the term I want to use? Um, uh, for, for like a Hollywood, if you were trying to conjure up what a, what a gangster in the 1930s and 40s would look like, I think it would look like uh, Black Bill Toco. Um, Papa John Preziola at the bottom there was an, became an important uh, gangster in Detroit. But the, the, the image I have there of um, the person slain there, uh, that's Harry Millman, and he, he was a, a member of the Purple Gang, actually a Jewish gangster. But the reason why I, I um, have this image in, in this PowerPoint presentation and I talk about it in my book is this was another example of the underworld politics that I'm interested in looking at. And what happened was, by the late 1930s, mid 1930s, the Italians were increasingly becoming the dominant underworld organization. And as a result, the Jewish gangsters, the Purple Gang, were declining. And the leadership of the Purple Gang made an arrangement with the Italians that we're going to have a peaceful transition here. We understand you're calling the shots now. We'll work with you and we won't cause any problems. Well, Harry Millman was a, a Purple Gang enforcer, pretty tough guy, gangster, and he did not go along with that program. And he thought, uh, I'm not, I don't take orders from anyone, let alone an Italian uh, hoodlum. <laughs> that was his attitude, pretty, he was pretty um, condescending. And uh, the Jewish gangsters and the Italian gangsters tried to warn him, like, we're not asking you, uh, this is not a negotiation, like we're taking over, that's how it's going to work. And he continued to defy the Italians, um, insult them, point out that he was going to mean he was going to be independent, no one could tell him what to do. And so eventually, uh, you can see what happened to this individual. And it sent a, a strong message to other members of the underworld that make no mistake, the Italians are calling the shots now. So just a, an important case study from, from this type of research. So I'm almost done here. We'll see what kind of questions you have, but I, I have this other PowerPoint uh, slide here that you may be interested in considering the, the um, uh, who's hosting this event this evening. Uh, a lot of these guys were living in Gross Point back in the day, or the, either Gross Point or Gross Point Park. And um, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because this relates to, to one of your other upcoming book talks here with this uh, lecture series. Um, back in the 1920s, 1930s, there were elements of Gross Point society, let's say like white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who were, who were not open to the idea of uh, maybe Italians, Jews, Greeks, Polish individuals moving into the Gross Points. And, th and there were ways to prevent that, um, but that wasn't going to work on Italian mafia guys. <laughs> you weren't going to tell them that they couldn't move in there. Uh, first of all, they had enough money that they could afford to live there. And also you just, it wasn't wise to, to, to tell them no. So um, early on, the high ranking Italian mafiosi moved to the suburbs. Sometimes there's a narrative in Detroit that suburbanization started in the 1960s late 1960s, that's not true. It actually, really, it starts as early as the 1940s. And in this case with the gangsters, we see it even earlier. Even by the 1930s, the, the mafiosi who had enough money had moved to the suburbs. Uh, there were still a lot of Italians on the east side, but the, the high-ranking guys were, were in the suburbs. And um, this example is actually a little bit beyond my book. My book ends around 1939, and this example is, is more of the 1950s. But I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but I believe that that was a house owned by uh, machine gun Pete Corrado, who is somebody I talk about in my book. He was an enforcer with the Terracini faction and a high ranking member. And um, Anthony Zerilli, Joe Zerilli's son, lived in a mansion across the street from there. And um, there's, just, there's just some fun 
stories about some of the some of these Grosse Point homes. I'm not sure how true they are if they're kind of urban legend, but in some cases we know some of these homes had underground tunnels. Um, in other cases, um, secret passageways to the river or to Lake St. Clair. And, and that's not just the Italians, by the way, there are other homes. Again, everyone was involved in, in bootlegging. So um, Gross Point kind of has a unique, I think, place in, in, in this type of, um, when, when you're studying this, this kind of history. So I'll just have one more slide here um, and we'll see what all of you think. But um, if you're interested in finding out more about me and my credentials and what I write about, I have um, a website. Um, I have a Facebook account for my book. And then also um, I co-host a uh, podcast called Original Gangsters. Uh, that's through um, Entercom Media. You can find it on radio.com, iTunes, other places. So um, that's it. So I, I like to keep it around a half an hour. That way I can see if other people have, have questions and I think I think I went a little bit over. I think I went about forty-five minutes there, but hopefully there's some time for some James, questions. I don't see any questions yet, so if I may ask one, it's Mike Skinner. On page seventy-three in your book, you have the Bucciolato plan. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> how are you related? Uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, yeah, I don't I don't bring that up in the presentation. I, I'm. I'm not sure how many people are interested in that, but um, as if you pointed it out, yeah, um, a lot of my book talks about the Bucciolato family and actually some of my direct relatives um, unfortunately didn't survive my book, um, including my great grandfather was murdered and uh, several of his family members were murdered both in Detroit and Sicily. They were involved in a transatlantic uh, mafia feud with another family. And so, yeah, those are my those are my direct relatives that I talk about in the book. Which um, the reason why I mention that is the Bucciolato family, just like some of those other families, it's it's a large family, and um, they're all over the United States. They're they're all over Sicily, and um, but if you read about certain Bucciolatos involved in this kind of research that I write about, then they're that's the line of the family that that I'm from. Now, are, was there anyone in the family that was concerned about the book's publication or about your work? Um, no, I think um, actually most of the people I've encountered, not only my family, but some of the other families in the book, it's usually pretty positive. I think that um, for some family members, not only my family, but other families, um, the uh, the people that were involved in these things didn't talk about them with civilians. So growing up, you always knew that there was something going on with uncle so-and-so or, or grandpa so-and-so and, um, but no one talked about it and you, and you really weren't, it wasn't considered polite to ask questions about it. So for some family members, you know, we're talking generations later now, they actually find it pretty enlightening and interesting. Like, Oh, I can, I can really find out now the truth about what was going on back then. Um, uh, but as long as you, whenever I talk to family members of, of any of these families, I just try to be polite and diplomatic. I think this is still somewhat of a sensitive issue in the Italian American community, especially not so much for younger people, but the old timers. Um, so I just try to be tactful and polite when, when I interview people <laughs> for this kind of material. Right. And not, not, because, not because I'm afraid of anything, but just because it's, I think that's the polite diplomatic thing to do. I, I picked up your book at um, Barnes and Noble. We don't have one in the Gross Points anymore. There's still one uh, on uh, the north side of 14 and John R. Northeast corner. Uh, and uh, so it's available there, but you, you could pick it up on your website too, right? And actually have you autograph it and mail it or, or how, well, how can you do that? No, I'm afraid, no. I, the link I have on my website is just to like Amazon. Um, so okay. you can, you can, um, uh, you can you can buy it on Amazon or you can go to Barnes and Noble. They have they should have copies in person. And um, yeah, I would say like right now it's probably pretty challenging for me to get an autographed copy to you. Um, I mean, one thing I can do, I mean you can always I see even even the university. I'm not because of this COVID situation. I'm not even down at the university very often. Um, I would say please uh, buy the book and just hold on to it. 
and um, I, I, I speak at these kinds of events often, and I, I hope that Gross Point will invite me again at some point where we can meet in person. Very and um, or, or another, I, I, I've given talks in all three counties and even Washtenaw, even beyond the, the Tri-County area. So hopefully once things get back to normal, we'll have an opportunity to meet up and I'd be happy to sign a book at, at another event. But right now I'm afraid I don't know the, um, the best way to, uh, to get that to someone. Very good. Now here, here's a question from a member of the Giacana family. Very interesting presentation and book. Thank you, I grew up in Palermo, uh, Terracini and um, uh, is it Sinisee? Sin Sinisee, and now I live in Gross Point. Uh, don't know, um, uh, don't know, uh, uh, didn't know there was a connection between the two areas. Can you mention a little bit about that? You, you've been back to Sicily to your, to your family's native area, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and that's just a, that's just a Detroit thing because other, if you look at other crime organizations, Italian mafia organizations in the, in the United States, it's much more um, open to, as, as long as you're Italian, you don't even have to be Sicilian. You can be, um, I mean, some of the most well-known Italian American mafiosi were not even Sicilian. John Gotti was uh, Napolitan. He was from, uh, uh, you know, Neapolitan from Naples, well, his family's from Naples. Um, and Al Capone was, um, was uh, Neapolitan. His family was from, from Naples. Um, and there's other examples, but in Detroit, it's real old school. Like you have to be, you have to trace your origins to Sicilia, to Sicily. And um, I'm not aware of any, any Italians in the Detroit mafia. They're all Sicilians. There, I'm, there may be some exceptions, but not that I'm aware of. And, um, but it's even more important. It's even more micro than that. I should say, um, you can't just be from anywhere in Sicily. Um, most of the membership uh, that, that we're talking about in my book, you can trace to these, to these towns. And again, I think it has to do with kinship and social networking. And, and these are, you're in a very precarious business, a dangerous business and um, trust is at a premium. And, and one way to filter people out is um, maybe I don't know you, but I knew your grandparents, I knew your neighbors, I knew your cousins and, and, you know, my understanding is that you're from you're from good stock, right? Like you're the kind of person I can trust. You're from the, my hometown. Our families know each other. Um, if I don't know the town that you're from, I don't know if I can trust you. I don't know what goes on in that town. Um, so <laughs> they don't know if I'm the right kind of criminal, then, huh? That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah no. That's yeah. That's that's how it is. And 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 in when I talk about those, those bloody years where there's a lot of conflict in the Detroit area between rival mafia factions, um, a lot of the, that violence broke down by um, uh, where you were from. Like, um, you know, guys that were in the Terracini faction fighting it out with guys who were from, from Chinese. And it's, it's very tribal in, in a way. And it's just, I think it's, it's interesting. Now, when you mentioned that that your great grandfather was murdered, uh, was it was that a gang hit? Yeah, he was he was killed on the east side, um, over by uh, Shane, um, not far from Eastern Market. And um, in that case, it, it's it gets more complicated. But you can read about it in my book. Th those were rival families from within the same town. So in that case, they were, they were actually from the same town, but the problem was they hated each other growing up in that town. And when they, when they migrated to the United States, they continued to not like each other. So it was very much like a, a mafia version of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Um, and they were, they were competing to be the, the hegemonic power in Casta del Mare. And so they were fighting it out in Sicily and that spilt over to not only Detroit, but also Brooklyn. There was some um, violence in Brooklyn between the Bucciolatos and their rivals. Well, well, we've got another question, but let me let me follow up on that one, if I may. I apologize sure. to the person asking the question, but did, how old were you when this finally was talked about at a family dinner or gathering or something? Uh, was it really common knowledge in the family when you were very young that 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 your ancestors were mafiosa? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, when I was growing up, I knew that 
my great grandfather was murdered and uh, almost as, as early as I can remember because we used to go to Mount Olivet Cemetery with me and my grandfather from my earliest memories. And we would go and um, so I knew he was murdered. I knew some of his cousins uh, were murdered. And, um, but what, what my family would say was mistaken identity that they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so you start thinking, well, that's, boy, what bad luck that, that uh, several members of one family happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But when you're young, you don't, you know, it just, it, you, you know, okay, together. Wh sure. whatever. And then I saw, when I was in high school, I watched the Godfather movies for the first time and it really changed my life. And I, I started sort of doing some math in my head and then I read the book, now I'm, I'm really going down the, the rabbit hole here, but um, Joe Bonanno was a, a well-known American or, um, Sicilian mafiosi in the United States. And he wrote a, an autobiography called Man of Honor where he, he mentions the Bucciolato family a lot and, and the, the war that was going on. And as soon as I read that, and I was probably 16, I thought, oh my God, like that's what was going on. And I asked my uncle, and he and he said once he knew that I knew, then then the truth started to come out. It wasn't a mistaken mind. identity anymore then. Right, that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, that's next right. question is: Will there be a, a new podcast soon on Original Gangsters? Oh yeah, that's a great um, that's a great uh, question. I, I I certainly hope so, um, and I appreciate your support. Um, I'm not sure how much I want to get into the the weeds here on this. Um, uh, let me see this. Let me try to be diplomatic here. <laughs> Um, my co-host and I would very much like to broadcast uh, on a regular basis and produce content on a regular basis. Um, we're having issues with our producer and issues with Entercom, and I'm not sure that the commitment is there on their side. And so my co-host and I are exploring options about maybe a different platform and um, I, I don't. I don't want to get into it more than that, but I certainly. Okay. I certainly hope so. And thank you for your support. I, I next, certainly. Next question. So. Uh, I find the era of mafia gangsters very interesting. In college, I researched and chronicled history of famous Detroit uh, Madam Nina Clifford and her relationship with the infamous gang uh, John Dillinger. For a book titled "John Dillinger Slept Here: A Crook's Tour of Crime and Corruption in St. Paul, 1920 to 1936." Uh, published by Minnesota um, Historical Society in 1995. Detroit had a very rich history in gangster activity going back to the 1920s. Uh, and then what is the name of the podcast again? And you just said um, the yeah, uh, original, gangsters. original gangsters. And uh, yeah, I think John Dillinger, I, I love reading about the 1930s outlaws and public enemies. And I've, I've published some, uh, I actually published in a academic journal, a peer reviewed journal, uh, and I used Pretty Boy Floyd as one of my uh, case studies to write about. So I'm, I'm very much interested in um, the uh, 1930s bandits, bank robbers. So um, not just not just the Italian mafia. And um, in terms of contemporary research, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in some of the um, like African American street gangs in Detroit. Um, so I, I, I can I'm interested in different case studies. Great. The next one, James, uh, I know you live in Sterling Heights now and had lived in Arizona when you were teaching out there. Uh, where did you grow up and did you go to the school in the Gross Points? Uh, no, I did live in Gross Point for a long time, though, but I did grow up on the east side. Um, well, I spent some time growing up in this area, Warren, Sterling Heights, but I also lived in St. Clair Shores for a long time and actually went to high school in St. Clair Shores. So um, and I, I played sports and um, I, I'm not happy to say that Gross Point North used to beat us every time, especially in football. <laughs> every time. We were, you at, were you at uh, um, Lakeview? Or at, uh, Lakeview or Lake I was Shore? at Lakeview. I, I went to Lakeview. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see anything else on chat or uh, Q and A. Boy, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, your book is available on your website or on Amazon, uh, and. Uh, Anything, Adam, is there anything uh, we need to add about future programs? And Yeah, so um, we have some uh, future programming coming up. Um, you can follow, again, um, all of our Bicknell lectures from this year are now on our new YouTube channel, um, which you can find by going to bit.ly, bit.ly slash GPHS YouTube. Uh, and so you can become a subscriber to our channel. All the Bicknell lectures uh, for this year are going to be posted there. 
um, in addition to older content. So um, previous lectures from, from past years will, will start to make their way on there um, as well. Very good. James uh, Buccellato, thank you so much again. I uh, hope many people pick up your books. want to thank everyone for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you again next month. Take care, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.